pleased to be here this morning. Uh, for those who may not know me, my name is Mike Copeland. I'm one of the nephrologists down in Vancouver, and I look after uh, the home program, the home hemo program. Um, I'm looking forward to, to today's session, uh, partly because um, I'm not giving a lot of the presentation. We're actually going to be hearing from the real people uh, uh, that, uh, that are involved in, in home therapies. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is uh, in the, in the, uh, the context of uh, equitable access for uh, therapy, um, some experiences that, that patients have had. And um, we, have, we have two patients as well as a, a provider uh, joining us today, a care provider or a family member who's been providing care. Um, and we also have an opportunity to hear from a physician from one of the remote communities. And I'll introduce everyone uh, as we go through. Um, and the, I, I've, I've promised everyone that you guys are going to be nice. So uh, I think there's a little bit of nervousness maybe about coming and sharing their stories. So I said that we're generally a nice group of people. So I hope everyone will be nice. Um, and the hope is that um, although I have a bit of a structured interview that we'll do with, uh, with, the, with the patients and with Dr. Shearer, um, I want to make sure that we have an ample opportunity for people to be able to ask questions of the people who are actually doing this therapy. You've heard lots of talks about the good things about home therapies and all the data about it, but really what it comes down to is, uh, is how people are doing with the therapy. Um, so what we're really going to talk about today is uh, trying to better understand the wishes and the wants of our patients, uh, which actually at the end of the day is what really matters about uh, everything we should be doing, but home therapies, this is a really important thing. And then another theme that I want to talk about, and um, I'm going to uh, help Dr. Shearer out here by saying uh, take some lumps for some lessons that we learned in terms of, and we and I learned about the relationship of a large center like Vancouver has to have with a remote community to be successful. Um, and some perceptions that, uh, that uh, as a center we have, um, we need to ensure that we are working collaboratively with the local community to be successful with this. And so Dr. Shear, I hope, is going to be quite honest with some of the uh, shortcomings we had and what we've done uh, with her community to try to help support the, the, the therapies and to be more successful. So we have a couple of things that we're going to do today. We actually have a, a video that we're going to start with. It's about uh, nine or ten minutes long. Um, this is created by um, uh, Glennis Whiting, who is right there in the audience. Wave your hand. Um, who is also the spouse of one of the patients that we're going to be hearing today. Um, uh, so we're going to start with that. Uh, and then I'm going to bring up and introduce uh, um, our panel of, of, of people. Uh, Ken Hewlett. Uh, Ken, who will go. We have two Kens. So we have Ken and Kenny. Um, uh, Wilson, as well as Clark Wilson, who is uh, Ken Wilson's son, um, will come up, and then also um, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Shearer. So, right now, let's sit back, and hopefully this will work. It did before. Oh, I jinxed myself. I said it was going to be fine. My kidneys was beginning to kidney failure. Uh -oh. Hang on. They wanted me to come down. Uh... Yeah, try to get that. There we go. Phew. Okay. The dangers of technology. Is this the correct one? Is this the correct version? Yeah. My kidneys was beginning to kidney failure. They wanted me to come down uh, in June. But it was in May when I found out I was really sick. My complexion and my body changed the color. It was kind of a grayish color. And I felt half dead. You know, they say you could almost taste death. Eh? I, I really couldn't physically get myself up to do anything mentally and emotionally. And I knew it was pretty well game over. So I just had to tell my wife, I said, it's time for me to go. I, I broke down and I cried. Well, I was asked to go and uh, visit Ken when he came to dialyze in the center. He'd had to move at this stage from Bella Bella. There's no hemodialysis unit there. And this gentleman was devastated. He'd had to leave his home, his family. This was the rest of his life. It was a massive change coming to Vancouver's big city and not where he wanted to live at all. I worked for many years as a cinematographer, and, and once I started doing 
hemodialysis. I had to leave that career for the most part. We were doing a, a documentary. As much as I enjoyed doing the work, it was absolutely exhausting. My mom and dad, they, they had diabetes. So I don't know if it's uh, because of the genetic thing yourself. When, when did you? Um... Well, in, in my case, I was... I was about seven years old. And it was this one summer. We were on holidays and I actually kind of got the flu that just didn't seem to go away. I remember I was going to school and after every class, going into the washroom and throwing up and then you'd feel okay for a while. And that sort of became my normal morning routine. When we got some blood work done, the doctors realized there was a problem with the kidney function. I was born with a single kidney and it wasn't draining well, so it was what they call refluxing. And uh, it was, as the doctor described, it was blowing up the size of a football. They managed to get the drainage working okay, but it had had some damage done to the kidney. And so over time, the function of the kidney slowly degraded. I managed to make it to 42 before I had to deal with dialysis. We have some people who start on home hemodialysis. It's what they do right from the outset, which is great and which would be a goal for us, but people even a year, two years, three years after they've been on dialysis who have come to the point in their life where they feel more comfortable being able to manage it. And people who have had a kidney transplant and who've had to come back after having a kidney transplant working for many years who uh, now have a new option. Dialysis is an amazing therapy. I've heard it described as something called uh, an out-of-the-ballpark therapy. When chronic dialysis first came along, people had a choice of not surviving and dying or suddenly being able to stay alive with this therapy. There's not much else in medicine where you go from 100% risk of dying versus staying alive. Maybe as a consequence of that, we were happy. We were happy that, that um, people were staying alive. And the focus started to change more into not just keeping people alive, but letting them live, keeping them feeling well and actually having dialysis become part of their, their life rather than their life. When I had to go for in-center hemodialysis, I basically had no control over my schedule. We went for the longest time where we couldn't go anywhere ever on a Friday night because that was when I was scheduled to be in dialysis and you have to remove so much fluid and clean the blood in a, in a short period of time and it's very hard on your system. By the time you drive to the place, then getting things put together and then the four hour dialysis run and then getting things disconnected and coming home, it's like a good seven hour chunk out of your day. And then you essentially feel like a, you've got a mild hangover but you somehow missed the party. In essence, three days of your week are really kind of shot. It's amazing when you see someone go from having traditional or conventional dialysis where you run three times a week, uh, four hours treatment, that's standard. You're on blood pressure medication, you're on phosphate binders, and patients aren't necessarily looking that well. We're giving them the minimum dialysis to keep them, keep them alive, manage their kidney failure. Once they go home, they have the choice to run a lot longer, and we've, uh, of course, extended hours dialysis. You're going to feel a lot better. The amount of medication you take is greatly reduced. Your dietary choices open up, and they start to look better. Their energy comes back. They are feeling way more in control. From a patient's point of view, I think the outcomes that really matter is quality of life reduction of medications, freedom of uh, diet, ability to travel. Um, and when we're starting to actually talk with patients about what's important for them, those are things that rise very high up. And then interestingly, when you, when you ask the same questions of healthcare providers, it's much lower down. And healthcare providers are much more worried about lab values and medications and, and mortality, you know, death rates. Fortunately, there's benefits on both sides. We do know that independent therapies have better survival and better um, control of the metabolic environment. You know, what, what we're doing with dialysis is just trying to clear out poisons and balance electrolytes and balance fluids. And people on, on home therapies actually do better with those parameters as well. 
as a doctor, I like to think that I'm really special, but I'm the least important person on the team. Um, the training nurse by far is the most important relationship that people have. Um, and, you know, we have a social worker involved, we have dietitians, we have pharmacists involved. Um, and, you know, the patient actually is the, the primary person on the team. The patient's actually the one that does all the work. We're there to support the patient. So not all uh, home dialysis patients will need a, a, a partner to do dialysis with, but I would say the majority of the patients I look after do. But it's a very big commitment for that family member to take on this job. It's not something that you can decide you're going to take two weeks holiday and, and leave. You know, dialysis for Ken Wilson is you know, three, four times a week and the son needs to be with him for the four hour duration of the treatment. And some of them will just support the patient in um, setting up supplies for the dialysis treatment. Some will help do the water filter changing, for example, the machine maintenance once a month. There's a few hours of work to change filters and disinfect the machine. You probably will have the partner collecting the blood workers. There's several aspects of the job. I was so impressed with Clark when I met him during the training phase. He's a very calm young man. He listens and I would tell him something once and he would remember. Lovely, dry sense of humor. He used to uh, catch me out a few times. He scared me once, you know, telling me dad was dizzy and faint and how many liters of water he was going to pull off his dad. But also, he was joking. Once you actually start doing, you know, doing all these processes and, you know, hooking up the machine, cleaning, you know, and it actually comes to doing it, you think to yourself, you can do it few days down the road, a few weeks down the road, like, oh, it's getting a lot easier. The other potential fear of home hemodialysis is just a little bit of isolation. The home hemodialysis community is of a size and familiarity that those fears and the isolation is gone because they do realize that there's always somebody available on the phone or can come out or they have somewhere where they can come into and get reassurance, get a problem solved. When we start the home hemo training, we will let the patient know um, to expect up to eight weeks. That's an average. Some people will say six weeks, but I prefer to err on the longer side, just so that they're not disappointed or frustrated or um, lose confidence in themselves. Uh, we train Monday, Wednesday, Friday, typically a six-hour day. If you try and spend any longer than that, you're going to lose them. They're too tired. During that um, six hours, they're actually getting their four, four and a half hours of dialysis treatment. I can actually only think of one, one patient in my, oh gosh, many, many years that I haven't managed to get home. I'm gonna watch you get this up. I was unsure of myself and I didn't want to, didn't want a needle yet. But, uh, she came to us, she picked up the needle and handed it to me and said, just do it. Do you remember the first time you put the needle yeah. in? Yeah, it was pretty much the first time. First time needling was our first step home. But you know, really thankful for for my son to do what he did. My kidney is beginning to kidney failure. They wonder if we come down. Perfect. All right. So, let me uh, let me invite up the actual stars of uh, today's talk. Uh, that was a, a really great video, uh, with the exception that I really hate seeing myself uh, on video. Uh, um, but everyone else looks really good on video. Um, so let me invite the the panel to come on forward. Um, we're going to let them hide behind the uh, behind the table here. Uh, so Ken, Ken, and Clark, come on up. Um, let me just introduce each of these guys as they come up. So first off, we have Ken Hewlett, who is one of our uh, home patients in uh, living in the Vancouver area. Um, uh, he's going to, uh, I'm going to ask them a, a few questions just to, to 
uh, tell us a little bit about themselves uh, to start with. Sitting next to uh, Ken is Clark, um, who uh, you've seen all these guys on the video. Um, uh, Clark is the son of Kenny, uh, uh, and they both live up in Bella Bella. Uh, and uh, Clark, I think in many respects, was able to facilitate uh, Kenny getting back home. And so, uh, as I'd say today, uh, all these guys are the heroes up here. But I think Clark actually is, a, is an extra level of hero because he really stepped up uh, in a challenging situation to be able to, to get Ken home. Um, so just briefly before uh, Dr. Shearer comes up, I just wanted to uh, maybe ask you to share a little bit about uh, yourselves uh, as to the reason that you wanted to, to come to home hemodialysis and maybe uh, Ken Wilson to put you on the spot a little bit, um, and I, I mentioned I was going to share this. When I when I first met uh, Ken for home uh, therapy, he was a, to this day still a unique situation. He came for an assessment for home hemodialysis, and uh, the first thing he said to me was, "Okay, my options are to do home hemo, or I'm going to go home and palliate and come off of the dialysis because I don't want to live in Vancouver." Um, and that was. Uh, you know, we've certainly heard that before from people living in more remote communities, but having somebody sit across the office from me uh, as we were discussing this um, was uh, was very eye-opening. And to this day, I actually remember uh, vividly sitting in that room uh, with you. So maybe I'll just ask each of you if you can share um, the your reasons and the experiences why uh, home therapy uh, became important for you, um, and then we'll we'll go on from there. So Ken Wilson, why don't I start with you? Thank you, Dr. Hoplin. Uh, it's been a full circle for me. I went on home he he hemodialysis and the experience I had. I'd like to let you know that uh, growing up in Bella Bella, a uh, community, I think we we're about 2,400 uh, me memberships there, but there's about 15, and there's about 800 of our people are off off reserve, they call it. But um, I grew up there in Bella Bella, and um, my family background is uh, my dad, he was originally from Kitimat Village, and my mom was... Um, her her dad was from a place called uh, we we say Kitashu or Klemtu. Uh It's about a village the size of 400 people, and um, his name was his, her maiden name was Hall, and my dad's name was uh, Charlie Wilson. I went to a uh, residential school. The issues with residential school is, uh, to many, is uh, it's a it's a not a very good experience. But uh, to me, I I've always never had a problem. I only went for that one year, and uh, I guess I was what they call a homeboy. I only went that one year, and I didn't want to go back to further my education. I dropped out at grade nine, but uh, my life experience in itself, you know, I'm, I'm really blessed to know that uh, coming here to uh, Vancouver, and I knew at that particular time, it was time for me to, uh, you know, give in to if I want to be around my family. And in my heart, I already made up my mind that uh, I would be... Uh, wanting to go back home. And that's, that's the way, way it is for us. And uh, that uh, the, way, the way that, that we feel for one another. In a community, when, when, there's a, when someone passes away, the whole community pitches in and supports morally the family of that loved one that is gone before us and it's always been like that since I was growing up uh, it's not never really uh, an issue with uh, how, how are they gonna do it because it's costly the factors uh, in Bella Bella's is uh, 
isolation. We're about 350 miles from home, and it's a, a place where things are getting better as time goes on that uh, for the people because they can ac access medical services. We have to come out for to see specialists such as Dr. Copeland and the ones that are under him. Uh, other than that, my, my experience with uh, dialysis in, in uh, St. Paul's Hospital, and I could see some ladies here that looked after us. It's nice seeing you all. It's always refreshing to see a bunch of you people that uh, you're acquainted with by, by the way it looks, but I don't know your names. Uh, but also, uh, I'm very thankful for my son. Since day one, he's been there for me. He put aside his uh, personal life so that I'd be able to be here today. I don't know how many years he's been with me and medically looking after me. Even today, he associates make sure that things are going way of the way I'm supposed to be handling medications and stuff like that. And but I'm thankful now that he's he said he didn't didn't know what he was gonna do after we did finish dialyzing and February I got my uh kidney transplant, you know, which is very beautiful that you know how I got it. It matters to me, and but I can never thank that person enough to so that, that I can be here today in front of you. You know what? What I feel from from you people is like the Midas touch. You know, well taken care of, and. Um, Normally, I'm not nervous, but today I really feel nervous. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm just so thankful for my son Clark here. He's uh, taking care of me for a duration of right from dialysis here. And he takes me down for my medical follow-ups and stuff like that. And I could never have a better son than that. He's been great to me. It means more than life itself. He's taking care of his mom. She's, she's a di diabetic. And um, I don't know the real answer why we become diabetics, because maybe it's the processed food. I don't know. I re really did not clear to me why. But there's too much uh, other stuff there in Valbella in the, in the store that uh, our people you know, they use too much of that junk food, we call it, which is not a good thing for anybody. Uh, but anyways, I, I'm so thankful that I could come here and share my life story. And uh, things were pretty well normal for me now, except I have to have an alarm on my, on my cell phone, 9 o'clock for my medication for the anti-rejection pills and stuff like that. And uh, 9, 9 p.m. comes again. But I'm thankful for our medical team in Bella Bella. They, they take care of our people very well. And uh, I'm thankful for Dr. Shear being here with us here today and we honor her for what she's done for our community at large. She's done a lot. Thank you very much. So, so I guess we're going to discuss about why choosing home hemo. Uh, oh, okay. Well, essentially in my story, um, I started out with issues when I was a child. And we managed to sort things out for, 
for a while, but damage had happened to the one kidney that I had. I never had two kidneys. And uh, uh, anyway, you saw that in the film. Um, so eventually I needed to go on to dialysis. I, I've done sort of all the different modalities. I've done uh, peritoneal dialysis initially. Uh, we actually had two tries at kidney transplants, but I'm apparently a little bit difficult. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up having to go on to hemodialysis. And of course with all of its the restrictions with your scheduling and, and so on. And uh, when the opportunity arose to be able to, to try doing it at home, um, the big advantage for me is eventually once we were home, we, we started doing it nocturnally. And, and that made a huge difference because for, for one thing, you get a big chunk of your day back. You can be like a normal person during the rest of the day. And for me, the other thing too is because you're doing the dialysis over a longer period, uh, just the things like you don't have the water restrictions, you don't have the dietary restrictions the same. I mean, you, you can't go crazy and drink a 24-pack of beer or anything like that. But but it's, it's uh, as I say to people, you can drink a glass of water without guilt if you're thirsty. And because that was always just the huge problem with me is you, especially in hot weather or, or you're traveling someplace and the first thing everybody does if they invite you into their home is they offer you tea or coffee and and uh, so for me the being able to do the nocturnal home hemo made a massive difference in my life it's just it's it's just much more like normal um, there's still issues around travel um, for a number of years we used to take the uh, we were using the AK95 uh, gambro machine and we actually had a, a system of some ramps and places where we could back a truck up to our house and then park the trailer in a specific place so we could load it back and forth. And we would, we would put the machine into our trailer and go on the road with it. Um, and we're, we're now using the NX Stage machine, which is quite a bit, I, I use the term portable a bit loosely. <laughs> but. But we've actually been able to fly with it. The airlines, um, some airlines are actually very cooperative, others less so. Uh, but they will take the machine. Um, uh, and uh, so this summer, we actually went to Europe with the machine and using the portable bag. Um, yeah, I think that's actually from, where is that? That might have been, that was from France. And actually, when we that was in two couple of years ago when we went to France, and we actually rented uh, the full machine with the bin and so on when we were over there, and uh, we took that. And we had a we had to get a big enough vehicle, and we should have had given you some of the pictures of the vehicle where it was like loaded to the teeth um, with supplies and stuff. But we were able to travel. We went to France, Britain, and and Ireland. Um, and uh, so um, it's, it's nice for me that the issue with the machines, the portability is, is a big advantage. But it, the, the whole advantage is the home hemo, just on the forget about traveling. It's, it's, it's just you have so much more control over your life. And, uh, and things like the fluid removal and stuff, if you're doing it nocturnally, it's so much gentler over a long period. You don't get the hangover and you, um, yeah, it's much more flexible. Uh, so maybe 2010 when uh, my dad had um, kind of figured out that he would have to come away for dialysis and, um, you know, I knew, I kind of uh, knew in the back of my mind that uh, home dialysis was going to be you know, was one of the options for him, and um, you know, going going away, I I kind of, I kind of didn't know if you know if we were going to be going back home or not. And uh, I I knew my dad wouldn't want to stay away. You know, our family had been growing quite a quite a bit, and um, you know, one of our main reasons for going away on to uh, go away on dialysis was my sister was you know she was pregnant, and that was uh, one of one of uh, my dad's biggest 
reasons to go away and uh, you know s seek the dialysis treatment that he needed. And um, I think that you know our family was our family was one of the biggest uh, biggest reasons why my dad chose dialysis, and uh, you know ultimately uh, our, our his biggest reason to seek the home dialysis and go home and do the treatments. Uh, that's you know that was that was his biggest reason for going home, and uh, you know obviously doing this for my dad was uh, you know was it was probably the best idea you know you know I wouldn't have it any other way you know I, I have no regrets on uh, you know doing this for my dad and you know he got to spend some good time with uh, our family at home and uh, now his you know his life's gotten better and it's you know hopefully it will stay that way for a while. That's great. Thank you all for sharing. Um, uh, really powerful stories about uh, about getting home. And we're going to come back and explore it a little bit more. Um, but what I want to do is to change uh, a little bit right now and invite Dr. Shearer to come forward. Dr. Shearer is the medical director in Bella Bella. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the community in Bella Bella. Um, and really, w the, the point I wanted to raise and what I'd asked her to be sharing um, as a big city guy um, is the unique challenges that we don't really think about in remote communities. And this is Bella Bella, but this applies probably equally to remote communities around the province. So. Hi, my name's Lorianne Shearer. I'm a family physician in Bella Bella. We have three physicians in our little hospital, um, five beds, seven long-term care beds. <coughs> so I'm here to talk about our kidney experience in Bella Bella. Um, Bella Bella is a remote, isolated community. We are an island. And we're right in the middle of the central coast. So what I want to do today is talk about where we're located, because most people know about Bella Coola. A lot of people don't know about Bella Bella. Um, we're not Bella Coola, which is a totally <laughs> different town. And we don't like being called one of the Bellas, <laughs> because the two communities are very, very different. Uh, um, Bella Coola has more money than we do, <laughs> and it's better resource. But that's another story, so I won't go into that. But um, with Bella Bella, if you look on the map here, if I were to drive to Bella Bella from Vancouver, <coughs> um, it's, well, it's 690 kilometers north of Vancouver. It's on Campbell Island. It's in the um, Inside Passage. And we can get there by air, which is a two-hour flight out of Vancouver, or by ferry. So the ferry, I would go to Port Hardy, and then it's about seven, eight hours up to Bella Bella through BC Ferries. Um, if you looked up here more, if my map was a bit bigger, you'd see Prince Rupert. So we're sort of between Port Hardy and Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert would be another 12 hours by ferry. Bella Bella is the home of the heart sick nation. To get there, we have a few ways. We have our two hour boat ride. We have our ferry, sorry, our ferry ride, eight hours. Um, we have our flight, which is two hours, stopping in Port Hardy. And we also, our physician group provides uh, health care to <coughs> Clem 2, which is a Kittasu nation. And that's about a 30-minute flight or a two-hour boat ride up there, as well as to Ocean Falls, which is a non-Aboriginal community of about 60 people on a good day in Ocean Falls, and about 300, 350 in Clem 2. There's our nice BC ferries, Northern Adventure. Um, Bella Bella is stunning. On a beautiful day, it's an absolutely stunning place to be. The water is our highway. Almost majority of people have boats from that town. And on a beautiful day, everyone's out on the water. Even the cruise ship lines recognize the beauty of our community. Um, this is, I think, uh, Holland America. We also have the Disney Wonder that um, passes through every Sunday um, during the summer. And these are some of our accommodations and you know, beautiful beaches. 
This is one of our family docs. He actually travels day to day by his boat from his home to the hospital. He's living the life. <laughs> and then we just have, you know, just more beautiful pictures of Arabella. Our friends, the eagles, and they're huge. They're huge. Like I wouldn't leave a small baby unattended <laughs> or a chihuahua because they would take it up in its claws. And then we also have Shearwater Denny Island, which is another community that we provide care to. But it's actually got 150 people. It's just like half hour boat ride. Bella Bella is a proud community. We have our artists that I'm uh, doing their cedar weaving. We have our singers, the dancers, the drummers, and we have our chiefs. Very, very proud community. We have our friends over on Denny Island, which is mainly non-Aboriginal. And then we have the children. The community has so many kids. Uh, this is actually done on sports day, which is the day that the fire engine comes out. So you hear the fire engine going. Um, you don't think, oh, there's a fire. You think, oh, it must be sports day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all these children. And I mean, these are, this is our future, right? And what we're trying to accomplish in Bella Bella is to improve the health statistics of the community so these children don't have to face the diabetes, hopefully. And there'll be lesser kidney disease and all the other sort of autoimmune diseases that are within the community. So this is our target so that these kids in 20 years from now won't have to face leaving the community for their kidney disease. Now, if you look at our population statistics, Bella Bella, around 1,500 people in town. Uh, Clem 2 has 300, 350. Denny Islands, 150. And then Ocean Falls, in the summer, swells to 60. But in the, in the winter, you know, 20 to 30 people live there. And they're mostly like old hippies that live there. <laughs> so, you know, it's a different type of, of folks <laughs> in Ocean Falls. Um, when we look at our health statistics, about 10% of the population between Clem 2 and Bella Bella have diabetes. Um, right now, I think when I checked, there's about 200 folks with diabetes in town. Now, when we look further, now this was based on my EMR, the Wolf EMR TELUS that we have. We calculated about 10% of our diabetics um, go on to develop kidney disease that requires monitoring. There's a lot with reduced kidney function, but we haven't referred them on yet. Uh, the other big things in the community is autoimmune disease, the lupus, the rheumatoid arthritis, primary biliary cirrhosis, thyroid disease. That's about 7% of the population. Uh, cardiac disease increase. It used to be when I first started 13, 14 years ago that um, I'd see a heart attack every three years. Now we're seeing two, three, four every year. So it's aging population, I think probably mostly causing it. And then there's the other health statistic that are university, obesity, alcoholism, unemployment, housing, which adds to the poor health of the community. So when we deal with um, kidney disease, like we're just sort of overwhelmed by it because it's always kind of a scary thing as we watch someone's creatinine going down or their ACR going up. So we depend on the bcguidelines.ca, which outlines how to treat, um, how to follow uh, kidney patients. So one of the guidelines says for values of less than 60 milligrams per minute, which are persistent, this indicates a reduction in kidney function. That's the point at which we will start referring people because we realize, okay, the kidney function is going down. It's going to continue to go down. Um, we need to do something about it. And when we looked at our diabetics, the 200 that were there, about 25% have an, an EGFR of less than 60. And when we looked at the entire population excluding the diabetics, there it seemed to be like about a 4% rate in the rest of the community um, for no other reason. Like, I mean, the reasons were allergic nephritis and uh, some vascular issues, but these were non-diabetics. And then the other thing we're looking at is the ACR, where we were told with BC guidelines that at greater than three milligrams per millimole in um, serial tests, that there's microvascular disease or glomerular disease. And we found that 12% of our diabetic population has an ACR of greater than three. And then it was running at about 3% in the rest of the population. So the reason I said we're always afraid of kidney disease is because we know it's going to progress. And really, we don't have a heck of a lot in Bella Bella. So what we have, like I said earlier, we've got the five-bed hospital, the seven long-term care. 
we don't have a lot of permanent nurses. We do rely a lot on agency nurses. We do have a community health center, the Helicook Health Center, which is run by First Nations. But it's really, honestly, not up to where it should be as far as what it can uh, provide for the community. Uh, we have our three uh, full-time physicians serving the communities of Bella Bella, Denny Island, Clemchu, Ocean Falls. And unfortunately, we have a lot of locums going through. So you know how chronic disease sort of falls apart the management of it when you have locums who are here for a week or two weeks. So that's always a problem. We're busy. In our clinic, we have about 14,000 visits per year just of regular stuff, excluding the kidney stuff. We run the hospital. The three family physicians run the ER. And we're really getting into telemedicine, which I think is going to bring more work to us, but in a good way. When we look at our population, we say about 2,100, we do factor in a times three morbidity factor because that diabetic probably has some CHF, a kidney disease, and everything else that goes with it, and very complex, complicated cases. Uh, making things a bit more difficult for us as well is that we don't have a home and community care program. Um, we're not funded through Vancouver Coast School for that, but we do have a wellness program which is for really the elders, a bathing program, you know, if they need some assistance in their home. There's that sort of stuff that can be provided, but nothing really uh, steady or nothing really significant for chronic disease. We do have a point four community chronic disease nurse who comes in and out between Bella Bella and Clem 2. So that's just a little picture of our hospital, and that's a picture of our health center. So just talking about our kidney experience, um, we've had a lot of kidney patients over the past 13 years. I'm using 13 years because that's how long I've been there. We've had three people on peritoneal dialysis. Two of them are in CLEMP2. And I should mention that CLEMP2 has even less than us. They've had two Health Canada nurses that run their nursing station. We've sent a total of seven people out of town for dialysis. We've had three people on home hemodialysis and we've had, we've been very lucky to have four kidney transplants. So with peritoneal dialysis, after it's been really well done, um, like I said, two of these people were in CLEMP too, so they're just really going to um, their little community with the nursing station. I found that the patients who did um, the peritoneal dialysis, they all came out really well trained. And other than some issues arising, like, you know, they didn't have this solution or that solution, which we solved, um, you know, they haven't, they weren't a burden. No one asked for anything, and the family did it really, really well. Um, the one that was most successful was a father-son duo, like Ken and Clark, uh, who managed for about three years on the peritoneal dialysis. In, in the end, I think all three of them died with infection in the end, but that was after a few years. Our out-of-town dialysis. Now, when someone's told they have kidney disease, the first thing is, I can't leave the community. I'd rather die than leave the community. So, they, you know, home hemodialysis was introduced. Now, 2007 was probably our first one. Um, th th that was a special case because the patient really didn't want anything to do with our clinic. And so she came into the community. She had her dialysis machine, and she did really well. Now, when I recall it, I always just thought about it as like, wow, you know, they sent this woman to the community. There was no support whatsoever. No one told us anything. But when I actually did a review of the case, it was all there. They had fun, you know. I was getting regular consults on the patient. I'd forgotten that. It was the patient who chose not to be part of, let us know it was happening. But, you know, it was all done. It was all above board. We didn't have any. When I look back on it now, I realize, now that was okay. The 2012 situation was very much different. This was a patient who started on home hemodialysis. And one thing that we said here was that there was no impact. She just kind of showed up in the community and she had her machine, which she said was a lemon because she kept having problems with it. But it wasn't the machine. It was really the patient. Um, she had been trained. I think she went through a couple training sessions, but uh, she didn't pick up the technique. And unlike Clark and Ken, there was really no family person working with her, close family, but no one was working with her with her hemodialysis. She reached out to the community for some help, 
but there was no community nurse who could kind of help her through the process. So after a lot of complications and, you know, us phoning the home dialysis team, telling them, no, you need to take away this machine, it took a while before she ended up going back to Vancouver um, with the, without the machine. I think that left a bitter taste in our, in our mouth because we knew nothing, it was, nothing good was happening at home. And even when we reached out to home hemodialysis, um, not, we felt that nothing was done. But I know that home hemodialysis is trying to make it successful for her by sending her off for more training. But we didn't like that. So when Dr. Copeland contacted us about Penny Ilsa, we were like, no, no, we can't do this again. We felt that the last situation was a bit dangerous. And uh, I know one of the doctors said, absolutely not, we can't do this. But they persisted. <laughs> you know, Ken, you know, came to us and says, you know, I really want to do this. And Dr. Copeland phoned us. And Dr. Copeland and Mary came up to the community. And it was just by doing that. And he promised, he says, you know, if it doesn't work out, we'll take them back. It's not a problem. And because we had that reassurance, then that's when we went back and said, yeah, okay, let, let's give this a try. But it's not going to work. But look what happened. When we found out that Clark was going to be involved and we saw how well Kenny was responding and the reports from his family, it was like, okay, I think this is absolutely doable. And, you know, we were totally wrong on our assessment because look at the man sitting there right now looking very well, thank you. <laughs> so this is just an example of the Medivacs. We depend on the Medivac system to get our, our sick patients out. We never had to do that with uh, Kenny. So our future. In 2013, that's when we actually realized that we needed to get more involved with kidney care. And that's when we actually really started following the BC guidelines for kidney care. Um, at that time, there was some talk about t telerenal, and we actually started a telerenal project with our telemedicine. But that sort of fell apart. What we were trying to do was for our chronic kidney patients to have them be able to access the dietitian, um, the social worker, the pharmacist through telemedicine. And we started it up, and it went well for a while, but then we lost the nurse who was doing it, so the project fell apart. And I'd just love to see that restarted because I think that could be really, really useful. It's one thing to talk on the phone to the dietitian or the pharmacist, and it's another thing to see them face to face. In two, uh, 2013, that's when we started with Dr. Paul Taylor. He started coming up um, yearly. And then he retired from, you know, the remote service. And that's how we ended up with Dr. Copeland. And we're very happy with Dr. Copeland. And he's been coming up uh, twice a year for us. And we currently have about 40 patients, 40 kidney patients that he follows. So in order for us to succeed and get better, we, there's certain things we need. One is a positive experience. And I feel that with Ken's case, Kenny's case, we have our positive experience. And the next person who we're told is coming up for hemo home hemodialysis, we're going to say, yeah, bring them on, bring them on. Um, we are trying to get a chronic disease nurse who's clinic-based. Right now, we're working with the JSC on a project to show how important having a chronic disease within our clinic is. And hopefully, um, we will get the funding for that. And that's going to take a burden off all the cr uh, chronic disease, not only just kidney, but diabetes and rheumatology and all that good stuff. I'd like to see a chronic disease nurse who is community-based, who has a working knowledge of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. We don't have that right now. Not that they can do the procedures, but they know what's happening because, you know, I personally don't know what's going on with these procedures. Community education. We've had a couple of uh, talks within the community. I think, yeah, Dr. Copeland and Mary did one. And prior to that, it was with uh, the, diet, the kid kidney con uh, team at St. Paul's Hospital. We need to restart that. We've only had two in the four years. I'd like to see telehealth used. In particular, that connection with the dietitian, with the um, you know, social worker, with the pharmacist. Family physicians need to be educated because I'm just still learning about the intricacies of kidney care. And just listening to a few of the lectures um, at this, at this uh, conference, I mean, there's so much I don't know and there's so much to learn. I think we should all be attending this conference as well. 
I just really the ongoing communication support. I think that we did really, really well in Ken's case. And I know the patients have always felt well supported. Now, you know, I think that the physicians can feel well supported too. After the success with Kenny's case, um, you know, we realize as physicians that they're there, you guys are there, and um, we just have to phone you. You're not a scary group at all. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think the last thing is, you know, anytime anyone wants to come visit Bella Bella, I'm going to recommend the summer, a nice sunny day. Please just give us, give me a call at the clinic, and I'll arrange for you to go out fishing or something like that. Go out to Quay. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, and I can vouch for that. You get an incredibly warm welcome every time you're in Bella Bella. I always walk in from the airport, which is about a kilometer away from uh, the town, uh, and every time I'm walking in, at least three or four cars stop to ask me if I need a lift into town. I was told last time it's because that's where the wolves live, um, but uh, <laughs> the differences of being from the city, right? Um, so we want to open it up so you can ask uh, questions. I do have some uh, questions that I, I was going to uh, start the ball rolling with. Um, so maybe uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, to, uh, to, the, to the two Kens uh, as well as to Clark. Um, we've talked a lot about the good, and I think we've often in these sessions we talk about the benefits of home therapies and, and whatnot. What's not good about home therapies? What are the things that you have enjoyed least about doing home hemo? What's been... What was the thing you were most fearful about? Maybe if there was an experience you want to share with us about things that went wrong, how did you handle that? And, and how did you feel the team was in terms of being there to help support you? So the, the, we've heard about the good. What about the, the bad and maybe the ugly? Uh, well, in, in my experience, uh, being being home and uh, doing my my father's treatments, um, you know, I was so, you know, I guess I'm pretty much same. You know, I was so well trained. Uh, you know, there was, you know, there's very <coughs> very few times where I ha had troubles with doing my dad's treatments. Um, you know, there's there's a few things that, uh, you know, were a little challenging. You know, was was uh, fluid fluid removals. You know. Uh, would go a couple days and you know we'd have to take off a little bit more at a, at a time and uh, you know my, my dad didn't tolerate that too much so it, it uh, you know made him uncomfortable and you know he went through uh, you know pretty you know it was uh, se severe cramping and uh, you know those that was pretty much that was pretty much uh, part of the only troubles we had on uh, during during treatments, you know there wasn't you know there's a few times we had uh, you know clotted machines or you know blood lines were clotted, but that that was pretty much about it. There wasn't uh, you know we didn't have too much troubles. You know, like I said, I was very well trained. I have to say, I I, w I was well trained too, except there are there are times when, despite the training, you you forget a clamp or you you do something somewhere and I'm sure all of you have probably had similar experiences um, and uh, but it, it took a little while at, at home to get used to the idea of it and I was talking to Dr. Copeland yesterday about how the number of calls to technical support like in that first month they're sort of you're always calling them about every little alarm and and this and that and but you, you know, you start to learn the little quirks and just the, the things that set the machine off and so on, and you, you just get more used to it and more comfortable with it. And of course, the danger with getting more comfortable with it is then, you s on occasion, you you skip the little checklist, and and uh, sometimes you miss something. Like we did when we were relatively new to the NX stage machine. Uh, they've actually changed this that you can't do this particular error anymore, but. Uh, where we forgot to hook the drain line from the, the drain line that's when they're doing the priming on that machine is is hooked up to the saline and and so on, and we forgot to hook the drain line up, and so what ends up happening is you start feeding dialysate back into that little one liter um, saline bag, 
It's amazing how large those bags can get before <laughs> they actually explode. Uh, so, but we did we did have one one occasion where we'd actually fallen asleep, and and then there's this big swoosh, <laughs> <coughs> and you know, th so you end up with a bit of a mess on the floor and and so on. But these things are all overcomable, and and once in a while uh, we've had occasions where we've had an, uh, you know just an alarm that you can't seem to solve, and and the machine ends up sitting for a bit, and you you end up having to abandon the circuit. Um, and so, but, and I, cause I, as I was saying, you know, I think I've made every mistake possible with the machine and, and I'm still here. Um, <laughs> and y y you know, there's of course certain things you need to be very religious about and that's like making sure the site's clean and, and, and so on. But a lot of it is actually in a sense fairly forgiving. Um, and so you don't have to be perfect to be able to do it. The uh, problem that I, myself, and uh, was n no no real bad experience, but as as a patient, as a recipient, you know, like my son said, it was it was kind of uh, bothersome, but yet I knew he was by right that he was doing right, the right thing. And what I seen in North Shore when Mary was there training us and um, my son there was watching her as she was setting up and everything like that, take, taking to get to know the machine and all the technical matters. And then uh, she had it set up and I was just sitting there just as a patient and needless to say, um, but uh, she turned around and she says, uh, you give him the needle and he says, uh, he replied to her, no, I'll, I'll just wait until next week. <laughs> and she said, no, you do it now. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was one of the experiences I remember, you know, that when we went to North Shore. But he did very well. His first needle in my arm, uh, as I said, uh, <laughs> He didn't have no problems there. He got it first needle, and then I I seen him and, and I said watching him for the second one, and the same thing happened, you know. So I just got confidence in my son what he's going to do for me. So it was good, and uh, I just uh, really. Uh, when when I got back home to the home hemo, I wanted to make mention to you that it's a real good medicine to the soul when you get back home and uh, you're home with your family and the surrounding morally they support you and uh, it, it, it it does something to you. Like even when I was here in uh, St. Paul's, I got to know you you people by the way of looks, but I'm very poor for names. Uh, but my son, he remembers most of your names and and he knew who you were. And I said, who's that? Who's that? He said, ah, she, don't you remember? <laughs> but it was a good experience all around. And I'm very thankful that um, he's the one that set me up for uh, receiving a kidney. He wanted to an application in for what whatever he had to do and to did did uh without hesitating and my my experience in because i never went through surgery in my life i'm i'm 66 years old now and uh, um i never regret going through it but when when uh i was going to go into the or I grabbed my son's hand and I prayed. I prayed and asked the Lord to undergird for my need, that you know all will be well. And I didn't know that it was four-hour surgery, 
and they kept me under the oxygen for another couple hours just to make sure everything was going well. So all in all, I'm very happy to see all you folks here and uh, to know what it means to us from an isolation place, isolated place, uh, the experiences I've had in coming around full circle and got invited to be here with you today. It's a real blessing to me. Thank you. I'll just ask if there's any questions from the floor that people would like to ask. I do have one other question I'd like to ask you guys. If you had uh, a, a, a peer patient beside you, somebody else who was on dialysis and you wanted to tell them about home hemo, what would you say to them? What would you say to them about uh, um, about going home? Well, I, I actually recently had a conversation with a fellow who I used to work with um, uh, a number of times, and he's ended up in a situation where he's had a, good, a failed transplant, and he's go having to go on to dialysis. And... Uh, and of course, he was very upset about the whole notion of losing the transplant. But but talking with him, it, it, it's as I was explaining to him, it, it's the difference in control over your life that you being able to go home. Uh, I d I don't live in a remote community, so for me, it wasn't a choice of having to lose having to leave family and so on. I, it wasn't that kind of severe a, 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 an example, but. It's just the ability to have control over your life, and you know we we can pick up and put the machine into um, a trailer or a motorhome and and go somewhere without. Ha I mean, I, I've traveled a fair bit when I was doing conventional dialysis, and but it's like pulling teeth to get to so many places, um, and you have to be really nice and beg and plead a whole bunch before. <laughs> <laughs> before anybody ever takes you, and uh, and it was the same like in Britain or in 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 Canada. It was extremely difficult at times to travel, and so just being able to take the machine on the road is is a is a huge bonus. And now with this smaller machine, now that we've got the modality where we can use the, the premixed bags and stuff with the NX stage, um, it it's you can actually do air travel. Which is something I haven't done for a long time, and uh, so yeah, there's a whole different level of freedom that you can have, and and even career-wise, because um, I was working in film business, and this other gentleman at, at works in the film business as well, and which you have really long hours and so on, and and it just does not work with doing in going into hospital three days a week. Um, it's it's a career-ending thing for that. Whereas if you wanted to. Um, I did go back and work on a television series kind of part-time. Um, I could have actually done it full-time if I wanted to um, uh, by being able to do the home treatment, and that was not a possibility at all with uh, in Sendry. What was your question? Oh, I often went, often wanted to go into St. Paul's and the renal center. And uh, every time I asked my son, let's go in there to say hello to our colleagues that we're there with before. He said, ah, we don't have enough time. And so I haven't made it back, but I, when when they found out that I was going to go, go to um, North Shore, do that home hemo uh, training. I, I was just a recipient as, as a patient, but my son was the one that was doing the training for, for me. And uh, But I, I would encourage those people to do so because having home hemo is, is real medicine to the soul. You get family surrounding you, but uh, Without uh, reservations, you people are just great. I always told um, Dr. Copeland there when we went for a meeting once, and and um, 
I think it was a social worker for the hospital, St. Paul's. I think his name was Ron. It was my son and I, and then uh, listened to the people around the table. I think Mary was there. And I think there was reluctancy to, for us to have a home hemo. But when I knew when the time was right, I spoke up and uh, said I wanted to have that opportunity. I want to have that chance to do that, do that training, which I'm very happy we did. And um, I said to them, I, I said, I either, either get that or I'll just go home and do palliative care from the rest of one of my days. And that was my, my, my final answer to, to them. But I'm very thankful, Dave, and all the great care that you people have given to us while we're there. Thank you very much on a personal note. So I just want to say thank you to uh, all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, Ken Wilson, uh, I think, is an ex uh, take him home as your memory that we should never underestimate our patients. Um, Ken was somebody that uh, there was a lot of uh, sense that he was not going to be successful at home, and he's now sitting here three years later with a transplant. Uh, if that's not the biggest uh, success, then I don't really know what what else we can <laughs> what else we can hope for. Um, the stories you guys share are the reason that I love doing uh, the home therapies. Uh, it's the reason most of us uh, get out of bed in the morning um, because it's really exciting to hear. And uh, Dr. Shear, I appreciate you coming and uh, sharing your experience. Um, and I would just uh, remind from the, from the regional centers when you're sending patients into the remote community, although our thinking probably has been don't worry, we'll take care of it. It's the dialysis, we'll take care of it. But don't forget, it takes a community to look after a patient. So uh, those relationships are very important. So once again, thank you very much for your time and sharing. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>